Okay, cool. It was great getting to see everyone this past week. Everyone's doing great. You're moving along on the curriculum very well. And by the end of it, you're going to have a great understanding on how to build all kinds of applications. In this little lecture, what I want to talk about is taking a deeper dive into RSpec and into testing. Before we get into the code, I want to actually put kind of a little bit of a frame of reference for how testing works at a whole so that you can kind of have a little background. I know when you went through the code along guide in month two of the curriculum, you built out tests and so some of the syntax things and uh, that kind of component is familiar, but I wanted to give you a little bit more on a background on you know, what testing is, what we're actually doing kind of behind the scenes, and also why it's important. Please feel free to message on Slack. Any questions you have while I'm giving the lecture, I'll keep on looking down there and I'll answer them as they come in. So start off, let's talk about testing and what testing is. Before the days of testing, the process for testing an application, or what's formally called the QA process or quality assurance process, is you would have a list of requirements, and from that point, you would have users who would go, and they were called testers, and they would go and they would test each one of the requirements. So if, for example, if the requirement said a user should be able to go and create a blog post, then they would log onto the site, they would go and click the links that were specified as you know, being able to create a blog post, enter the information in, see if it works. That was manual, which would be which was slow in the first place. But the part that was even worse is that it was not dynamic at all. So, for example, say that you had the entire testing team go through the full set of requirements. What happens if you get another requirement or another feature request, and that feature request is, oh, by the way, I want to have my Instagram photos show up on the bottom right hand side of the screen. That's not a big feature, but what happens if what you put in place when you create that API connection, let's say that you have a little syntax error, that would break the entire application, and you may not actually even know it until you've pushed it to production and someone has been able to test it. That was a really bad way of building software, and that's the reason why tools like automated testing really came into fashion. So, what automated testing does is it's where we write code that will go and it'll actually be that tester for us. So we create code that will go and it'll create, uh, it'll run tests on methods or classes and we can also leverage tools for integration tests that will test actual features. Just like you have a real life human being tester who goes and does that. And I'm going to, what I wanted to do is I want to give you a little bit more. I want to step back and write some very basic RSpec code and then take a few more advanced examples. But then I also, I thought it'd be fun for me to build a real life dev camp feature on the live broadcast. And so I thought that'd be cool. It, this is not a rehearsed thing, so no judging if I get anything wrong on it. We're all going, you're all going to see me do it in real time. So if I do make a mistake, you will be able to witness it. Before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about the actual content. So you hear about testing. Testing is this big concept. So, you know, we have testing. And for the sake of this, we're going to say this is only for automat automated testing because there's also, there is a place for manual testing, but that's more of something that just the project manager and the QA team does. What we need to do is actually have automated tests that can run at any time. And I'm going to show you when we build the dev camp feature, exactly how that can work and how it can help us make sure that we're not going and we're not breaking anything in the application. So a couple different ways of performing testing. The first is unit testing. 
So unit testing is when we are very specific about what kind of behavior we're wanting to test. So for example, say that you had one of my favorite methods, the full name method. So we'll say that we want to test the full name method. And yes, I did the little parentheses. We would never do that in Ruby. I'm just doing it to show that that is a method. So we're testing the full name method. That is a very isolated way of testing. And it's good for certain things, especially say that you have a complex algorithm. You want to have some tests that are unit tests that only look at this one specific feature. So that is what unit testing it is. When you find a class or a method and you just test that one specific item. Now we also have the concept of integration tests. Now integration tests are much different. Integration tests actually have the goal of testing the entire workflow of a feature. So let's take that blog example that I gave you in the very beginning where we would send a manual tester out and they would go, they would log into the site, they would go to a specific page, they would find a button with a specific ID or text, then they would go to the next page, fill out a form, and then they would expect to have the blog post created. To do that manually is definitely a slow process. What an integration test does is it allows you to build all of that behavior into one snippet of code. So here with our integration test, an integration test actually tests for behavior. So anytime that you hear the difference, you're going to hear two terms that are very popular. One is TDD, which stands for test driven development and the other is BDD, and that stands for Behavior Driven Development. Anything that is an integration test, which means that you're testing multiple components in the application, this falls under the category of Behavior Driven Development. So when you hear me talk about BDD, that is what it's referencing. And there's a couple different policies that people have when it comes to testing. If you go and you work for a formal kind of Ruby development shop, you're going to be asked to perform some kind of testing. And usually it's where we do exactly what we did in the month two syllabus with the code along course, where we write our tests before the code and we actually let the tests lead us along and the tests are what lead our development. Whereas, and so you with BDD and TDD, technically you could do both of these after you've written the code. So you could write out the entire application and build it all, code it from scratch, and then afterwards you could write the tests. And the term for that when you do that afterwards, that's called regression testing. And the only reason why you would do that is because Take, for example, going back to our blog example, you could have regression tests in place so that in the future, when you want to add a new feature, if you add it, if it breaks something, your tests will tell you right away. You saw that in the month two course. I would make some small change that didn't seem like it would affect anything else in the application. You'd run the test and you'd see some other part of the application broke because of it. If we wouldn't have had those tests in place, then we wouldn't have known about that and it could have led to some bad behavior and the client wouldn't have been happy. So both ways are fine. You're going to get different opinions from pretty much any developer that you talk to. The, and I definitely recommend for you to have a discussion with Curtis about it on his opinion. He and I haven't really talked about that in much detail, but I would definitely I'd love to hear what his opinion is on it. In the Ruby community, Ruby used to be 100% TDD or BDD. You had to write your code first and then the, code, the tests led your development. It's kind of changed a little bit over the years where a lot of people, what they would do is they would end up taking too long in writing their tests. And they would, what the bad thing is that they would do is they would write tests that weren't even really testing their behavior. 
they weren't testing the application, they were testing the framework itself. So they would write tests that really were only making sure that Rails was functioning properly, which that's kind of pointless. So Rails has thousands of tests that they have on them, their automated tests that will only work and the framework will only work if all the tests are passing. So they are very good about that. We don't have to go and test Rails functionality. We have to be careful that we're intentional about it and we're only testing things that are specific to the things that we're building. And while we're doing that, let's talk. Uh, if you have any questions, please let me know what they are. And I'll keep Slack open in the background and you can message me with any of those questions. And in fact, I'm going to keep the Slack open here on the left hand side just so I can see it pop up if you ask any questions while I am typing. So starting off, the first thing that we are going to have to do to start running through testing is I'm going to switch just to the desktop just so you have kind of a clean place to create a file. So I'm going to go to the desktop. You can follow along if you would like. And the first thing that you need to do, we're going to use the RSpec testing library, which means that we are simply going to have RSpec give, it's going to bring in all of its classes and methods, and it lets us have a really nice, clean interface to test with. So there's nothing really special about RSpec besides the fact that it gives us the ability to create expectations and then test to see if our code passes those expectations. Just like a regular test, when you as a student take a test, you either pass or fail that test. It's the same exact thing here. Your code is like your, the student and the code either passed or fails the test that we create for it. Now in order to do this, you may or may not have RSpec installed on your system. So before we can actually start writing the code, you have to install it. So you can run gem install rspec. And for this guide to start off, or kind of basic example, we're going to initially just go into just pure rspec. If you remember back to the Rails application that we built, we used rspec Rails and use that gem because it has some nice, helpful integrations and some Rails specific generators, but here, we're just going to use pure RSpec. The code's going to look identical, but we're not going to let the Rails side of it get in the way. So first thing I'm going to do is create a file. I'm going to stay in Vim on this. You can definitely follow along in Sublime or whatever text editor that you want to use. I'm going to do it just so I can stay in the console and so I can also see your uh, questions as they pop up. So I'm going to create a file here called rspecdemo.rb. And the first thing that you need to do whenever you're creating a set of tests is you have to bring in the gem itself. So first, bring in Ruby gems. And then after that, bring in the rspec gem. So once you have those, now you have all of the specific code libraries. It's important to know RSpec is not the built-in Rails or default test library. Uh, Ruby has a much more lightweight version of the testing library called Test Unit and Mini Test, and you you could use those. They you know you, those are a little bit easier. Or they're lighter to use, but the syntax is a little bit easier on RSpec and it also has more features. So I typically use RSpec in pretty much all the applications that I build, but you can definitely take a look at mini tests and uh, see which one you prefer. So first thing that we're gonna do is I wanna create a dead simple matcher. So I'm gonna create a describe block, and what this describe block is going to do is it is going to describe a specific scenario. So we're saying that I want to describe some tests that are going to fall into the math category. So here I'm going to say describe math and this is a block so we're going to say do and inside of it we have to create a scenario for it to test. So describe is like the category. This is where you say you're saying that I'm describing math tests 
And here, this is where we're saying that these are the specific things we're testing for. So you start off with the keyword it, and then you just pass in whatever the test is that you wanna do. I'm gonna do a really simple one, and I'm gonna say it should have two plus two equaling four. And from there, the it block, or the it method takes a block, and inside of it, you create the actual expectation. Now, there are a couple ways of doing this. We could go with a very pure, in this case, a very pure Ruby math way and say two plus two double equals four to test for equality. And now if I save this file and run it, and to run it, you run the command rspec, and then the name of the file. So I'm gonna run rspec, rspec demo, and it says right here that it finished. It gives you how long the test took. Gave one example, zero failure. So everything is passing with this example. Now this is okay. However, you're not gonna see a lot of tests in rspec written like this. You know, saying two plus two double equals four is fine, but usually you're gonna use a specific expectation method. So for that, you're usually gonna say expect, and then you pass in the expectation. So I'm gonna say expect two plus two, two equal four. Now if you notice this syntax, this is a little bit easier to read. It's more like you have pure math here where you have a expectation. So we're saying, uh, or I'm sorry, pure English, where you say expect two plus two to equal Four. So that's exactly what we're wanting to do, and uh, I love how easy it is to read it just like that. So I'm going to quit out of this, run our spec again, and as you can see, this passes exactly like before. So there's no difference. It's simply a, a different syntax, and uh, the end result is the same, though. So that is how you can do things like perform math tests. Now, let's also see how we can test a specific class. So we actually, because of the way our spec is built, we could test the string class. It's kind of pointless to test the string class normally, but usually it'd be in a Rails example, you would do something like, you know, describe user or describe post. And as you can see with the syntax, we can actually pass the class itself. Now, since I'm going to use string because it's built into Ruby and we have access to it. So I'm going to say describe string and then do. And inside of this, I'm going to say it should return a blank string. Now, this one right here is I'm saying that I should have the ability to grab string and set it equal to this. And I'm using the first syntax just like on line six where I did the double equals. And if you're wondering where we get string, if you remember back to the, uh, to the Rails code along course, the customary convention is to create variables that the tests have access to. So I'm gonna use let and just pass in the variable string. We could call it anything. We could call it str, we could give it a name, anything like that. And let takes a block. So I'm gonna use curly braces to keep on one line. And I'm going to say string.new. And now what this is going to do is it's going to look at, it's going to establish the string. It's going to create a new string, which, as you know, equals just these empty quotation marks. And then we're saying is string, which is this variable right here, is this equal to the double quotation marks with nothing inside of it? And the answer to that should be yes. So if I save this run it again, and you can see that that pass, we have two examples with zero failures. Now, let's actually see what this looks like if we have a failure. So going up to our math example, let's say that we expect two plus two to equal 10. Save this, run it, and you'll see that here we go, we have a failure. It says math should have two plus two equaling four, but we got a failure here 
saying that the expectation was 10 and we got four. So in other words, the real result was four, but this is the expectation. And this is one of the reasons I really like using RSpec as a testing framework because it gives a fantastic interface here for creating and setting up expectations with what reality is. So reality is what you got, 10 is what we expected. And then we can go in and fix that one example. So here we can say change it from 10 back to four and everything will be passing. Moving down the line, and please, if anyone has any questions, please do not be shy to ask them. I can answer them while we're, uh, while we're in the middle of any of these. So moving down the line, I want to talk now about creating objects. So it's getting a little bit more advanced. So far, we've tested some basic math. Then we've tested a class just like this. But now let's get into actually testing a real-life object. So I'm going to say describe user. And inside of this describe block, I'm going to create what would kind of be like a user, like the type of user that we would have in a real life kind of application. We're not going to connect to a database, but if you remember, a great way of mimicking the way that a database object works is by using the struct class. So I'm going to create a struct inside of this. So I'm going to say, you describe user, and then say it should have a full name. And inside of this, we're going to create a first a struct. So I'm going to create a user struct and say new. And for this struct, I'm going to say first and last. And if you remember what that does, is it creates a user object with a first with attributes of first and last. So now we just have to instantiate it, which would be kind of like getting it from the database. So in a Rails app, this would be like running a database query for a user. So I'm going to say user equals user dot new, and then let's just pass in my name for Jordan Hudgens. So just in review, if you are still a little bit fuzzy on the struct class, structs give us the ability to create uh, objects and pass in parameters just like this. So it's a really easy way of being able to kind of mimic what you'd get from a database. And here it's like we're creating a database user. And what we want to do now is we want to create some expectations. So I'm going to say expect user.first, just like it was a database query. So I'm going to say user.first, and then we're going to pass in a matcher that says to not equal nil. And I'm going to copy this line, paste it down here, and say user.last to not equal nil. So what we're essentially saying, what our expectation here is, is that we want to make sure that the struct always has a user or first name and a last name or else it should give us a failure. So this one should not fail because I did give it a first name and a last name. So let's run this again. You can see zero failures. Switching back down on line 21. Let's take out the last name. Take out the last name. Run this again. And as you'll see here, whoop, looks like, yep, we're perfect. We do have a failure. And so it's rare when you're actually looking for the failures like that. Um, so here what it says, let's come and read it. We say user should have a full name. It said that uh, we expected the user last to not equal nil. The expectation was for the value to not equal nil. So see how it translated this for us? So it said, even though we said expect, to not equal, it translated that into the to not equal conditional here. And then it says what reality was, was we actually got nil, which was not what we wanted. So that is how you can read those. And the other nice thing is it gives you a really detailed report on what the failed examples were. So not only does it tell you the file, which we already knew, we're only dealing with one file. If you're dealing with dozens or hundreds, this is even more helpful. And additionally, 
you have the ability to even know the line where this is at. So if I go into Vim, and I can know that right down on line 19, this is where the failure occurred. So to get it back in passing, I'm just gonna pass in, Hudgens, run this again, and everything will be passing. So we have three examples, zero failures. Now before we get into the actual demo, I, or into the additional demo, we're in demo right now, but before we get into the real dev camp one, I wanted to show you how to do something really cool, which is to create your own custom matcher. And I'm gonna put all of this code up on a, on a guest so that you can pull it down and play with it. But what I'm gonna do is open up the code and on the very bottom, I'm going to do what is called creating a custom matcher. So right here, we have expectations. So th these are things that are built directly in to our spec, and that's how we have access to them. However, our spec is really flexible and lets us define our own matchers for when we want. And the way that you do that is you say our spec colon colon matchers. So we're grabbing the our spec matchers module and we want to define it. So we're grabbing one of the methods from the ma uh, matchers module. So we're going to say our spec matchers define and then you pass in as a symbol what you want the method to be. So what you want the matcher to be. And because we already have our example of how this should work, I'm going to say we want our matcher to have to be named have a full name. And then as a block variable, we're going to pass in user. Now inside of this, we're going to use the method match. This is something that is coming from our spec. So we have access to the match method and it takes a block. So I'm going to say match do pass in actual as the block and some of this don't worry if some of this looks kind of weird especially if you've never seen anything like this before after i finish writing this and make sure that it all works we're going to come back through the code and kind of review it so inside of the match block i'm going to say user dot first is not equal to nil and then user dot last is not equal to nil and just so you probably have noticed what we're essentially doing is I wanted to show you exactly how you could rebuild this kind of behavior completely from scratch. Because I think hopefully by seeing what's happening on in the background may help give you an idea of uh, you know, how it works when you're building the tests. So I'm going to say end here. And now what we can do is we can actually call this. So I'm going to create another describe block. So this one is going to be describe and we can just say user from custom matcher. Inside of the do block, let's create a before. So this is anything you put inside before will get run uh, before each test. So I'm going to say before and let's create our same, uh, let me just come up here and copy it. So I'm going to create this same object here and go down line 35 okay and so here we have user and i want to make this a uh, let's say custom user so that's going to be in the before block and now we can create our test now if you remember it up here all of this code we had to write here this was how we had to write it when we were using a, you know, the expectations and that kind of thing. If we build our own, it's pretty neat because we can actually pass it in like this. So we can say it should, and then just pass in the test. So remember our test name is have a full name and then pass in a method uh, or pass in a, uh, a variable. So I'm going to make this an instance variable here for user. And we're going to pass in this user that we created. So if everything there is properly set up, then this should work even with our custom matcher, even though we didn't use expectations or anything like that. We actually created our own 
should have a full name method here. Let's see it. And there you go. That worked perfectly. Let's test it to make sure that this failure still will work. So if I come here, delete this, save it. Now we should get a failure. And we do. So right here we have a failure. It says user from custom matcher should have a full name. Now, if you look at this, this isn't really, this isn't as good as some of the failure messages that we had up here. You know, right here we got all these really nice, cleanly, uh, well-organized methods and failure messages. So let's see how we can actually do that. Because whenever you're creating this, a test isn't very helpful if it doesn't give you details on what's actually failing. So here we have match. This is what's creating the actual matcher. But with RSpec, what you have is the ability to pass in a custom failure message. So I'm going to say failure underscore message. And this takes a block. The block will be actual, the block variable. You could call it anything just like we put actual up here. All this is doing is our spec knows to pass in what the actual value is. So here I'm gonna say failure message, do actual, and inside of this, you just pass in whatever message you want. So we could say expected that, do some string interpolation. So expected that actual would have a first and last name. Now if I hit end, now let's try this. And as you can see, look at this. This is a little bit more clear on the actual message. User from custom matcher should have a full name. So this is our, this is our specific error message. And it said expected that user from custom matcher would have a first and a last name. And it shows that we had a last name of nil right here. So that's a way, and you can customize those however you want. So that is how you can build a custom matcher, which hopefully gives you an idea on everything that's actually happening in the background. So well, the way our spec works is the expectation method like this. This is simply kind of like what we did here. So expectation, it has something like this, except it'd be, it'd have the word expect here, but it takes in the actual values. It's a little bit more custom, obviously, because you wouldn't hard code first and last name, but we've kind of recreated the expect method, which is pretty cool. So hopefully that gives you a better idea on how that works in a, uh, in a real life example. So before we move on to the dev camp, real where we build a real feature example uh, are there any questions on that okay so let's get into the actual uh, let's get in and build a real world feature so I'm going I was asked this morning and this is something that you guys will be able to use as well is the ability to download links off of the DevCamp website so right now, video link. So right now, if you go to the website and go to, you know, like learn Ruby on Rails from scratch and click on any of these, you have this video here and you can hit play and you can watch it, but they want the ability to have a link so you can actually download this. So that's a feature I already had on the product pipeline so it makes sense to let's just use this lecture to build it okay so we're and we're going to use our spec in order to do this so let's see I'm going to first hit get status just to make sure I don't have any pending changes I'm also going to type in our spec to make sure that we're working in the green which means that we do not perform any work if we have failing tests so if you have any failing tests, they have to be fixed or they at least have to be marked as pending. You do not want to try and deal with multiple failures at the same time. That would be incredibly challenging. So here, as you can see, we are all in the green. We have 116 current RSpec examples with zero failure. So we are good on this side. First thing I'm gonna do is create the expectation. 
And actually, let me also open up Slack so you guys can ask me any questions in the background. So I'm going to say, I'm going to go into specs. This is going to be specific to guides. So it's going to be features and the guide spec. You may notice that this is very similar to kind of the work that we did with the overtime app where we have features. This is where our integration tests go. So the work we're going to be doing today is going to be behavior driven development. And if you open this up, you'll see all kinds of tests related to guides. I'm going to search for where I have show items. So let's see, all kinds of tests. And there we go. So we have a show page right here. And you can see that we have some tasks like first that renders properly. Uh, then it renders the guide code in a H1 tag, different things like that. Let me copy this code because it's going to be relatively similar. So let's see, copy this, yank it, and copy it over. Oops. And give us some space. So I need to fix this. We don't want to say renders the guide code. We want to say renders the guide. Uh, let's see, how do I want to name this? Let's say renders the guide video download link. And make sure you use do for the block. And now I'm going to keep this. We want to visit the guide URL. And then we want expect the page to have CSS. And I don't want CSS because I don't actually know if I'm going to do, uh, I don't know what kind of CSS I'm going to do yet. So I'm going to make an easy test. I'm going to just say have content. And then inside I'll just say download guide video. So uh, this is all I need on this test. Now if I quit out of this and run RSpec, I'm not going to run the full test suite because it's pretty big. So I'm going to run spec, features, and then guides. So this will only run the test inside of that guide spec. And we should get a single failure here because we haven't actually written this code. There we go. So we have a failure and it says expected the page to have the content download guide video, which I actually think I want to change that. Let you see, this was on line 96. So I'm going to open this up on line, oops, I jumped the gun on that one. Uh, I'm going to open this one up and go to line 96. I don't like that the way I worded that. So download guide video. I just want to think I want to do just download video. It's a little bit easier to read. And now what we have to do, we have our failure. So now we actually have to make this work. Now I'm going to create the most simple passing test possible. And then we're going to go back and we're going to get it working. So here I'm going to go into Vim, App, Views, Trails, Campsites, Guides, Show. Now you wouldn't know how to get there. I just do this because I work on the application every day and I know the structure has trails with nested with campsites, nested with guides, and I did know that this was a show page. So that's just how I knew that that's where it's located. So this is the view code for a guide page for anyone ever wondering. We have some partials, calling alerts, we have our breadcrumbs, all this uses bootstrap, so some of these classes may look familiar to you. Here we have the options for when we used to have YouTube videos, pretty much all of those are gone now. And I'm actually working on this guide for a guide show page for some other things. We're about to start hiding these for all users and only students are gonna have access to see the videos. So I'm going to be putting some more, uh, some more things in here. But this is the main spot where it says if guide video file present, we know that this is the video file. Uh, we could also, you know, open up the schema file and look and see what the, you know, what the thing is. But uh, I already know that it is video file. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a div. And inside of this, I'm going to put a link. So I'm going to say link to download video. I spelled it right. And then inside of that, I'll say 
this is going to pass in the actual URL. So this is guide.videofile.url. And the only problem with this is the, the test that we're going to be passing in won't have one of these. So I'm going to have to, I'll, I'll, I'm going to, have to work on my, uh, on my test and create a mock to make this work. But we'll just pretend like this has a video file and, uh, and we don't have to worry about that. We can still get the initial test passing, which is our first goal. So here I'm going to pass in a, uh, an HTML file attribute called download, and this will pass in guide.video file, and that's what we'd need to actually get that side of it working. Um, but I'm going to leave that out till I create my mock. Okay, class, and then button, button, let's see, we're going to say button large, button primary, these are just bootstrap classes, and then pull right. Okay, so this theoretically should work. Let's actually, uh, let's see if this gets our test passing. Run the same RSpec test again. Oh, look at that, all kinds of failures. Let's see what happened here. So here we have a template error, undefined method to model for the video. Okay, so here we have the video file link to. Yeah, and this was the issue that I was actually kind of afraid of with this. I have to create a mock that is going to, uh, uh, that's going to tell Carrier Wave what to expect. So here, let me just pass in. Remember with RSpec, when the rules, you first create the most, the, the most simple implementation. So I'm going to pass in just the root path and see if this gets what, us what we need. There you go, and you have all of those passing. Now if we take a look at what this looks like in the browser, I'm gonna go Rails S uh, dash B 3000, uh, let's see, sorry, dash P. And then dash B, these are things you don't really have to worry about until you get into bigger applications that need to use things like subdomains and things like that. But that's how you can, using LVH as a way of doing that. Okay, so now this is the live site. This isn't a, a local one. I'm going to go to rails.lvh. And let's see if this is working. So my intro section. And there you go. And we have our download video, which will will build in the uh, I'll, I'll build in the ability to download it. But that is and and I'm going to also send you guys a link when this is available. So I'm planning on having this feature finished and all polished up by the end of the day. So I'll send you guys a link so you can actually start downloading the videos if you want to have them for offline purposes. But that is how you can build out an initial feature and how we've actually built one out live here with DevCamp, how you can download the video. So are there any questions on that whatsoever? Awesome, sounds good. Well, we I'll be staying in touch with Curtis and we'll have something prepped for you on Tuesday, same thing. And some of the pending things we've been talking about are some fun courses like uh, uh, like giving you guys a intro into how to use Vim for a text editor and some other advanced kind of things. So please give Curtis plenty of feedback on you know, the kind of things that you'd want more details on and I'll prepare the uh, additional deep dive courses just like this that we'll be doing on Tuesdays and Thursdays from here on out. <laughs> Sounds good. I'll, uh, I'll do one with a turkey right in the background. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll have a special Thanksgiving deep dive lecture. Everything, all the code's going to be uh, some kind of, some kind of turkey theme on it. Sound good? <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, great, great job, everybody. Uh, it was once again, it was awesome seeing everyone. You're all doing very good. Proud with how far everyone's making it. And let me know if you have any questions whatsoever. Yes, I thanks and thank you, whoever set up that Slack bot. I appreciate that greatly.